is uh, Merleau-Ponty and the Myth of Bodily Intentionality, which is an old symposium paper in Noose from 1988, which is really cool. So I was in the break, and it's not going to be on the YouTube, but like I was complaining about how I don't like um, most people's phenomenology. And Merleau-Ponty was this uh, French phenomenologist and philosopher and psychologist from the mid-century who died too young. I think he had like a brain aneurysm or was hit by a bus or something. So it was just one of these uh, tragedies that people were expect expecting like big things of like his philosophy, and it he didn't have enough time or chance to you know, get it done, but, um, yeah, <coughs> so as always, feel free to ask questions, and here we go, here's a story that is currently popular in some circles, I mean, this is one of these, nowadays, is like, oh, I heard this from some people, very important people, it's popular in some circles, <laughs> Any theory which tries to account for the intentionality of, the th of thought by simply talking about mental representations is bound to fail. Now, this is in 1988. A lot of stuff happens in the 90s. But, like, this is, I guess, maybe some of the start of people complaining about mental representations not being in the right sort of, sort of orientation to the world. Like, just having a, like, a representation, like a model of the world is not actually how we relate to the world. So you can have a, you know, a model in your mind, like an idea of how the world is, but that incorrectly gets the correct, the correct uh, way we interact with the world. So, like, it's fine as a representation, but the intentionality, which is how we are relating to the world, is um, going to fail if we're just using uh, re representations. Such an approach leads inevitably to methodological solipsism, and that, in turn, does not allow us to say what it is that mental representations are about, does not allow us to make the right connections with the external world. This is what I'm saying. It's like, if you can't talk about the external world in terms of representation, because you'd still have to take your representation and relate it to the world, because the two things are kind of separate. So you just have to, like, the representation itself is not going to be sufficient for how we relate to the world. Because you'd still have to uh, relate the mental representation to the world. And then if that's another representation, then you'd have to do it again ad infinitum. We must therefore pay more attention to the connection between mind and world. Moreover, we must recognize that intentional thoughts and representations as traditionally conceived can only take place against a background that does not require explicit representations, a background which objects are grasped and actions are performed in ways that are significant or meaningful without being explicitly encoded in a system of representations. Yes, yeah, so this is basically saying you need something over and above the representation. Author says, here's a version of the same story with an added cast of characters. The mistakes that lead cognitive science, as exemplified by Fodor and defenders of artificial intelligence, into the impasse just described have all been made before. Husserl made them, and in doing so showed the hopelessness of this approach. In order to understand intentionality, significance, indeed thinking, we must follow Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty and see thinkers as embodied as beings in a world, as having skills, knowledge, abilities that are not reducible to encoded rules, abstract thoughts, systems of symbols. If Husserl is the villain of this piece, perhaps then we should cast Merleau-Ponty as the hero. After all, his emphasis on the role of the body, of the dependence of intentionality on the body's interaction with the world, makes it natural to look at his theory in an attempt to understand how our thoughts are about things in the world. Okay, so I assume that the author is going to explain more about this, but basically why uh, Husserl is the villain of the piece is because Husserl allowed for logical structures to be imported from the world, which would be like sort of you're getting a representation from the world, uh, logically structured, uh, it's called the uh, noema um, structure, that, that's what you're getting from the world, you're getting something that has a formal structure, and so that would be a kind of representation of the world, but you don't, it's, you just get this, and so the idea that you're just getting this um, is like just getting a representation. So how do you actually get that? Well, now you need some sort of embodiment, and that's what the author is calling uh, Merleau-Ponty the hero, because Merleau-Ponty talked about how your body interacts with the world and gives you information. So it's not just you're getting some structure in the Husserlian uh, sort of like package, this sort of this uh, you know packet of knowledge. Um, 
you get you have to do something with your body as uh, merlot ponty would say or not would say as i'm i'm claiming here Okay, in this paper, the author proposes to explore this suggestion. I will begin by tra trying to indicate what Merleau-Ponty might have to offer by way of insight into the problem of intentionality. The focus of this first section will be, of course, the role of the body and the concept of bodily intentionality. However, I shall argue that one needs to look at Merleau-Ponty's position with regard to two questions about intentionality. Focusing on the first while ignoring the second would result in a misleading picture. The two questions are, one... What role does the body play in establishing or grounding intentionality? Two, how is the body how is bodily intentionality possible? Author shall argue that the answering the second question leads to the conclusion that the bodily that bodily intentionality is best understood on a representational model that is a model on which symbols account for the content of intentional states. Interesting. So they're saying the body's a big symbol generating machine. Okay. Section 1. Why do we need bodily intentionality? Before filling in the details, let's start off with a rough overview of what it is that Merleau-Ponty has to offer. The general idea is something like this. The intellectualist picture of explicitly represented rules and structures is misguided. This is the old thinking that, like, you know, we think in terms of, like, a rule-based system. <coughs> What's this? We're getting, uh, messages? Oh, shut up, Twitch. The idea is generally something like this. The intellectualist picture of explicitly represented rules and structures is misguided. It ignores the fact that perception in particular, but ultimately all thought and significance has its roots in the body. It is through or with the body that we move, understand the world, perceive, and, under and even understand words. The contribution of the body cannot be reduced to or defined in terms of abstract structures of thought. The latter are possible only by an artificial analysis of and selective focus on aspects of the former. In this section, I should like to fill in the details of this sketch and make some important corrections for I shall suggest that this is not an entirely accurate picture of the concept of bodily intentionality which Merleau-Ponty presents. I shall also start to set the stage for the second section in which the possibility of explaining bodily intentionality is explored. I've also uh, mentioned this in the past, but um, there is a Hubert Dreyfus audio, uh, there's l audio of his lectures on uh, phenomenology and Merleau-Ponty um, floating around somewhere on the internet. I think it's on YouTube at this point. You can like download it. So if you're interested in um, further stuff, and I, I can almost guarantee, ah, what did I do? Really? Whoa! What the... Okay, I hope you guys are still here. But like, that was scary. I'm sorry. Huh. All right. <laughs> My apologies. I don't know exactly what happened right there. That was uh, very interesting. Let's see if this is uh, what's busted here. Hey, Maddie. Welcome in. Yeah, very strange. That was unusual. Uh, every now and every so often things break. Yeah. <laughs> we were here to experience. I hope you guys are still here, but then it blinked out again. Now it's back. Yeah, that was... um. Welcome to streaming where you just don't know what happens sometimes and you're not going to find out because that's not how things work when streaming. Yeah, I clicked on the title bar of the uh, PDF reader and it just broke everything. The idea that clicking on a title bar should change anything. This is one of those. This is what I mean. There is no reason why clicking on a title bar just highlighting the window should change anything broke everything it's amazing but yeah oh hey maddie uh, i've seen you over in uh, aristotle's uh, welcome in here generally what i do for people who don't know is uh i just read random shit in philosophy and comment on it and try to see if there's anything worth talking or any ideas i think are of any worth 
So you let me know if you have any questions, anyone in chat. Feel free to ask about this or anything else, really. And uh, yeah, that's all. And just chill out and uh, see what's going on. <clears throat> yeah, so I think what I was talking about, there is a Hubert Dreyfus lecture on phenomenology floating around if you are interested in some of this stuff. And at least you'll get a flavor of what um, is going on. And, you know, so, and he's a good lecturer. He, um, you, can, you can understand what he's like when he's talking about stuff. What, uh, he, makes, he breaks it down pretty good, at least to the point where you can get a flavor of what's going on. Okay, anyway, let's continue. Merleau-Ponty's emphasis on body... Um, Merleau-Ponty's emphasis on bodily intentionality rests on two theses. The first is that perception and action, as opposed to thought, judgment, or experience, where that is understood as sense data plus interpretation, provide the primary way of interaction with the world. So is that perception and action are the primary way of interaction with the world. The second is that this form of intentionality is fundamentally and essentially different in kind from the picture of intentionality that emerges from a theory which focuses on consciousness as a mental event. Arguments for the first thesis are easy to find. Those for the second are much less clear, but no less essential. The first thesis obviously comprises two parts, one about perception and one about action. In both cases, it is easy to show that Merleau-Ponty held the relevant thesis, but somewhat more difficult to explain why. With regard to the first part of the thesis, the part dealing with perception consider the following passages. And there's a big old quote, quote. In perception, we do not think the object and we do not think ourselves thinking it. We are given over to the object and we merge into this body, which is better than which is better informed than we are about the world. We pass from double vision to the single object, not through an inspection of the mind, but when the two eyes cease to function each on its own account and are used as a single organ by one single gaze. It is not the epistemological subject who brings about the synthesis, but the body. When it escapes from dispersion, pulls itself together, and tends by all means in its power towards one single goal of its activity, when one single intention is formed in it, through the phenomenon of synergy. Okay, so just a quick recap. It's that you see things not because you are putting the two, your two, eye, you see things in 3D, not because you are putting um, the two images from your eyes together, but you see things in 3D because that's how the body actually interacts with the world. And that's what they just said in the first part of this little quote was that the body actually understands the world better than like our mind does because it's the one like putting the 3D together the body not the uh our epistemology where we have to somehow think about making a 3d object which of course we don't do no one thinks about seeing the world in 3d you either see it in 3d or you don't because you um, can't do that for whatever and, like you just cover one eye up but like the body does it regardless it's not something conscious that you do to see in 3d okay similar claims are made about the role of the body in establishing the significance of behavior or acting and quote, consciousness is being towards the thing through the intermediary of the body of movement is learned when the body has understood it. That is when it has incorporated in it into its world and to move one's body is to aim at the things through it. It is to allow oneself to respond to their call, which is made upon it independently of any representation. Motility then is not, as it were, a handmaid of consciousness, transporting the body to that point in space of which we have transformed a representation beforehand. Yeah, so all right. basically then we the way we interact with the world is like how we react and interact with it. But like that's how we already are interacting with the world. It's not that we think about it, then we do stuff. It's that when we actually just are interacting with the world, that is a, a way of uh, grasping the world. It's not that we think about it, then act. It's that we just we just start to act. And that's really what it is for us to uh, properly interact with the world, not like forethought and then do it. It's just, just go do it. Once you can, just go do stuff. Like you don't think about how you walk, you just go walk or whatever it is. And so if you try to think about how to do it, that's not the same thing as doing it. Okay. The arguments for these two claims are generally negative in character. Merleau-Ponty argues that classical theories which place consciousness at the center of their explanations are inadequate and offer an expanded account of the role of the body as the only viable alternative. 
two phenomena which, according to Merleau Ponty, cannot be explained by classical theories are A, the quality of our perceptual experience, and B, the way in, in which our ability to move, to function, to relate to our body breaks down in pathological cases. Let's look at these arguments in more detail, starting with arguments about perception. Merleau Ponty argues that perception is A, in some sense, immediate, B, unified, and C, non thetic or pre conscious, although perhaps pre conceptual might be a better description. Part of his argument is based on a contrast between normal perception and pathological cases, such as a patient who, when shown a fountain pen, must go through a series of descriptions such as, it is black, blue, and shiny, it is rather long, it has the shape of a stick, and so on until he finally narrows the possibilities down to a pencil or a fountain pen. Merleau-Ponty contrasts this with the normal case in which, quote, the object speaks and is significant, the arrangement of colors straight away means something, Whereas in the patient, the meaning has to be brought in from somewhere else by a veritable act of interpretation. Yeah, so this is the thing. If I hold this thing up right here, it's like, so you can see that reasonably clearly, I bet on your screen, you can tell that this is just, you know, not a fountain pen. This is just a plain old uh, ballpoint. Although, fair enough, I have fountain. This is a fountain point pen right here. I do have a fountain point pen right there. So it's like, but did you have to reason to understand what that thing was? Or can you just figure out, oh, that's a pen. Like, that's all it is. You're not deriving, oh, the shape. Oh, the color. Oh, that cap. The thing at the top is a cap. Oh, it's a pen. Yeah, you don't do that. Okay. Uh, author says, other arguments focus on perception of color, the fact that color is determinate only in a broader context, which includes light, the organization of perceptual field, the object and its texture, and a variety of other factors. This unitary quality is not limited to vision. Merleau-Ponty makes similar claims about the interdependence of the senses in general. Frank Big Time says, because of the resolution, I actually had an intermediate state where I could tell it was a writing utensil, but didn't know what it was a pen for seconds. See, that's the thing. But like, exactly, Frank. It's like you were you had this mediation because I know I'm in this little corner right here. Um, and so depending on how big your screen is, it might you might not actually see. But like you can say, oh, it, when it but when it does click, you can tell you're like, what is that? Oh, it's a pen. And then you do have to realize. But like if you were just to like, you know, like boom, like as big as it was, like if I went and was like. Like, maybe you can see, I uh, don't know, see, now it's not as easy to see. But, like, that's the thing. It's, uh, but, like, yeah, that's the whole point, though. It's, like, you can tell immediately it was a writing it, it was a writing utensil, but then you can narrow it down. But, like, you don't need the reasoning for the immediate writing utensil. So. <coughs> This unitary quality is not limited to vision. Merleau-Ponty makes similar claims about the interdependence of the senses in general. Yeah, I mean, you can also think about this. Do you hear a car, uh, like a door slam? Or do you make an inference after the fact that it was a door slam? Or do you just hear a door slam? A lot of times you have to say, look, I didn't like reference like, oh, it sounded louder this and then like it sounded like wind. Oh, it's a door slam. No, you just understand like a car door slam or like a bigger other uh, something like a house door slam you know what that sounds like and you don't reason about it once you have that immediate uh, sense of it then you're not like reasoning about it anymore and that's the what is more primal from Merleau ponty okay thus he rejects traditional accounts which start from simple discrete sensations or qualia and rely on and rely on principles of association or intellectual activity such as conceptualization or inference to account for the uh, perception of objects in the world. Experiencing such pure and simple pure and simple sensations is unstable and alien to natural perception. The example of the Schneider, the patient described earlier, is designed to show that the conceptual process required by what Marlowe Ponty terms intellectualist, that is Kantian, theories is quite different from normal perception. Yeah. And you can think, are you really reasoning about whatever's in your room or do you just see what is in your room? The whole point is that we do not have to make like inferences or if you do that, you're being intellectualist or Kantian in trying to put like further structure onto the actual experience that you have of like the things you already recognize around you. 
Let us grant for the moment that these considerations do provide arguments against any attempt to account for perception as the reception of bare stimuli, plus the imposition of sense or significance by some separate act of interpretation, judgment, or whatever. That is, we should not try to break perception down into a hyletic element plus an, int plus an intentional one. What does this prove about the body or bodily intentionality? Yeah, uh, hy uh, hylos, I think, is from the... Uh, Greek is from like the uh, the matter of the world. It's like so, like you're not looking at like the pieces of stuff, and then what the intentional one. You're not adding things together. So that's the. Uh, if you don't know the word hyletic, I'm just trying to put my Greek back together. Okay, what does this prove about the body or bodily intentionality? The simple answer is that perception, as described here, requires the perceiver to be in the middle of a situation, or as Merleau-Ponty puts it, must inhabit a spatio-temporal world. This requires a body. A disembodied mind could not enter into the objective physical world and be a part of it. A full coexistence with the phenomenon is required. Nor would a mind simply in a body, as a pilot is in a ship, to coin a phrase, exhibit the unity of the lived body. The body would become a mere mechanism. Thus, Merleau-Ponty concludes that we must conceive of the body and its role in perception in a new way, a way that recognizes bodily intentionality. Arguments about the need to recognize bodily intentionality as revealed in action or behavior are similar in many ways to those about perception and therefore will, will not be discussed at length. Although the details vary, the themes are the same. Neither the empiricism or, nor intellectualism are capable of adequate accounts of certain phenomena associated with behavior and the proposed alternative places primary emphasis on bodily intentionality. As noted earlier, the phenomena in question tend to be contrast um, as noted earlier the phenomena in question tend to be contrasts between normal normal behavior and pathological cases both phantom limb cases and those resulting from neurological damage once again the conclusion is that we need a pre-objective form of being in the world a motor intentionality which gives actions a significance that is not an intellectual significance the nature of the arguments for bodily intentionality dictates what is, for our purposes, the most significant feature of this new form of intentionality, that is, the fact that it is essentially pre- or non-conceptual. Recall that Merleau-Ponty's objection to traditional accounts of perception and action was that they entailed the involvement of subjects who represented situations, formed judgments, and applied the concepts whenever they perceived or acted. He argued that these assumptions were simply inconsistent with the facts. To avoid the same mistake, Berlo-Ponty must therefore conceive of bodily intentionality as something that does not require symbolic representation, explicit concepts and rules, or forming intellectual judgments. Indeed, he explicitly emphasizes this feature. Quote, what impairs thought in Schneider's case is not that he is incapable of perceiving concrete data as specimens of some unique eidos or of subsuming them under some category, but on the contrary, that he can relate them only by a quite explicit subsumption. Living thought then does not consist in subsuming under some category. Yeah, so like you don't have to reason into some form. You have to you just see some form. You don't reason that something has a form. Continuing the quote, it is not easy to reveal pure motor intentionality. It is concealed behind the objective world, which it helps to build up. The history of apraxia would show how the description of praxis is almost always contaminated and finally made impossible by the notion of representation. Our bodily experience of movement is not a particular case of knowledge. It provides us with a way of access to the world and the object with a prac tognosia, which has to be recognized as original and perhaps primary. My body has its world or understands its world without having to make us make use of my symbolic or objectifying function. End quote. That is, the body acquires that familiarity with the world born of habit, which allows us to function. Indeed, the body through habit develops its own form of understanding. The body and bodily intentionality also play an essential role in claims about sedimentation. One needs a sedimentary history, a background against which thoughts have significance. We shall examine this topic more carefully in section 3, but it is important to note that this fact about bodily intentionality, more than the rejection of Cartesianism that Marleau-Ponty emphasizes, 
that makes Merlot Ponty the putative hero of the story which began with which we began. Where are we? Okay, 7 to 14. We're getting there. Before moving to the next section, I would like to pause at this point to forestall a predictable objection to the, to the reading of Merleau-Ponty which, with which I have been working. Someone who reads Merleau-Ponty from a Heideggerian perspective might protest that I have radically misinterpreted his discussion of the body. Rather than thinking of the body as a thing or entity, albeit a very special kind of thing, this objection suggests that the body itself is literally a structure, a framework, and not an entity at all. Frank says, I think it's interesting that this bodily understanding really punctures the real understanding in the Chinese room. Yet, this is one of the reasons why I was bitching about the phenomenology earlier. Um, because this really, like, this is part of, like, the big argument uh, that was going on in, like, late 20th century. And as I was saying, there's a, the, Surly, the Searle's Chinese room as I was saying, Hubert Dreyfus was railing against the Chinese room experiment when he was talking about phenomenology. He hated that. He was saying this is like completely like, like, like he was a, this was a big topic for him. And so this is the sort of thing exactly. And I'm happy you, uh, picked up on that, Frank. Like, this is exactly right. Um, this is like what is the interaction that you need when you understand something you need this sort of like way to in interpret the world and it's not this book of rules that like that doesn't make sense and so as uh, simmons was saying from earlier what is there to, in the understanding and that this is the part of the understanding is this bodily intentionality or at least that's what would be claimed from uh, this faction of philosophy is that the bodily intentionality is what's missing out of the understanding of a language so, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so from the Heideggerian sense, like, what is the body? It's like you're giving, you're putting a structure on being. And so it's not an entity at all. It's a structure on your being that, uh, sort of like a control structure. And that's what Heidegger would say. The author is saying, look, from the Heideggerian perspective, you're talking about a structure on whatever your being is. But the, be the body as a structure is not like an entity at all. You're the being, and that's like a, a restriction on you, kind of. Continuing. There are numerous passages which could be used to support this Heideggerian line. The general point is that the body as object, the thing which is studied by physiology and biology, quote, is formed by a process of impoverishment from a primordial phenomenon of the body for us, the body of human experiences, or the perceived body, end quote. The perceived body is not to be confused with the objective body. Nonetheless, there are three reasons which suggest that these passages do not discredit the interpretation offered here. First, the passages which support this reading are concerned with the way in which we conceive the body, the way in which we first understand and perceive it. But claims about conceptual priority do not automatically translate into metaphysical claims, and I shall argue in the next section that when we ask how bodily intentionality is possible, we must see the relation of the perceived body and the body as physiological object from a different perspective. It is no longer a question of how we come to understand our body and the world, but how we can justify a realist theory of intentionality. Second, remember that part of the reason for examining the concept of bodily intentionality is to see whether it has any significance for the projects associated with contemporary cognitive science. In order to see Merleau-Ponty's project as relevant at all to this question, we must take his discussion of the body to apply to an existing entity as well, and perhaps a structure of experience. Otherwise, one could not draw any conclusions about the sort of thing that can possibly have intentionally, which is what someone like Dreyfus wants to do. And this is exactly what I was talking about, Dreyfus. Um, like, who talks about these things? Finally, a defensible interpretation must, as far as possible, preserve the arguments Merleau-Ponty offers to justify talk of bodily intentionality. We saw earlier that part of this argument involves the need to inhabit, be in the middle of, the spatiotemporal world in which we encounter physical objects. If the body were merely a structure of understanding, a form of function, a form or function, it could not be situated within the world in the requisite manner. Thus, I am willing to grant what I have called a Heideggerian reading is important to a complete account of bodily intentionality. It does not, however, prevent us from realizing that the body must also be seen as a unique kind of entity or object, and asking for more details, and asking for more details about that. 
Uh, yeah. Um, Dreyfus makes the point that um, basically, even though Merleau Ponty claimed Husserl as who he was taking after, um, Dreyfus argues that he's much more of a Heideggerian than Husserlian. Uh, I don't know how, like, I, I'm not in a position to judge that claim, but, like, you'd say basically, look, what the author just said is accurate. You can say, like, the Heideggerian being is important, but, like, you can add this as an addition on top of that, how the body structures uh, our being is not uh, in contrast with Heidegger. You can say it's, like, a, maybe a modification of that sort of position. Okay, how can the body be intentional? Uh, like, intentionality is how we are, like, how we uh, relate to the world. How can the body be how we relate to the world, you could say here. <coughs> the author says, The time has come to look more closely at the meaning of the phrase bodily intentionality. What exactly does it mean to say that the body has a unique form of intentionality that is not reducible to the intentionality of thought? The traditional construal of intentionality has been aboutness, like aboutness. Something is intentional if and only if it is about something which need not exist. But the claim that the body is about things sounds initially nonsensical. The notion of intentionality as directedness is somewhat more promising. If being intentional means being directed towards a possibly non-existent object, then it becomes possible to say more about the claim that the body is the body itself is intentional. However, for the most part, Merleau-Ponty seems to favor an even broader notion of intentionality. To say that something is intentional is to say that it is significant. In this section, I shall explore the question of whether the idea of body, bodily intentionality as presented by Merleau-Ponty is a coherent one. If it is not, then the thesis that the body has its own unique form of intentionality will not be an acceptable solution to the difficulties discussed in the last section. There are two distinct questions to be addressed. The first is, what does it mean to say that the body has its own unique form of intentionality? For the moment, we shall take it to mean that perception and behavior are significant, have meaning in ways that are not grounded in the intentionality of thought or judgment. This is vague to be sure, but will do for a start. The second question is, how does this work? Merleau-Ponty himself seems to suggest that no explanation of bodily intentionality can be forthcoming. It is an ultimate fact. But this is inadequate. We must have some reason to think that, think that bodily intentionality is a sensible suggestion, and that requires an account of how the body itself renders the world significant, in what sense it does so. That sort of explanation is simply not to be found in phenomenology of perception. And phenomenology of perception, I think, was a book by uh, Merleau-Ponty. There are, however, some suggestions about what such an explanation might look like. Specifically, the entire discussion in Part 2, especially Chapters 3 and 4, exhibits both implicit and explicit ties to the structure of behavior. Since that work is centrally concerned with significance and behavior, it is reasonable to look there for an explanation of bodily intentionality. A major theme of the structure of behavior is the concept of three orders, an understanding of which is necessary in order to develop an adequate theory of human behavior. The three orders are the physical order, the vital order, and the human order. The latter is also referred to as the mental. Since it is clear that the explanation sorry, so since it is clear that the explanation of the phenomenal body and significance make essential use of an appeal to distinct orders, we need to ask what the relation is between these orders, and it might mean, for example, to say, as Merleau Ponty does, that these orders are three dialects. Or dialectics? Yeah, not are, are three dialectics, not three powers of being. And dialectics would be ways things uh, interact with each other, like relate, uh, talk to each other. The key, Merleau-Ponty tells us, is to see behavior and the mental field in terms of form. Earlier, the concept of form has been expl explicated in terms of functional organization and total processes which cannot be understood through a mechanistic senses of the physical parts of a system. Nonetheless, form and function are not hidden behind the physical world as an extra element. They are different structures, perspectives, if you will, from which phenomena can be described, understood, and explained. The three orders and fields, when explicated in terms of form and function, begin to look very much like what D.C. Dennett has more recently termed stances. 
on his view stances or perspectives which we adopt in order to understand various phenomena, especially human behavior. It is probably not a coincidence that the stance which Dennett is most interested in is the intentional stance, the stance from which we view behavior, including linguistic behavior, as being about something as being significant. Thus, when we move away from a physiological account of reflex movement to a theory of behavior or from a causal, that is, stimulus-response theory of psychology to talk of the mind and consciousness, we do not add a new type of entity or being. Quote, we could not simply superimpose the three orders, not being a new substance. Each of them had to be conceived as a retaking, a, as a retaking and a new structuration of the preceding one. End quote. Yeah, so if like you're like relating the body to the mind, it's all a restructuring of the same stuff, and it's a matter of perception. I don't know how much you, you want to put it, like how much we anyone how much stock anyone should put into that, but like basically you're saying we're not actually they're not three different things. It's you've got a trinity, there's a unity, and we're just looking at this in like a uh, three different ways of looking at the exact same thing. It's a stance. It's not that the thing is different. It's that we're looking at different perspectives on it. Okay, continuing. Our original concern was the question, how can we explain bodily intentionality? By appeal to the structure of behavior, we arrive at the hypothesis that is to be understood as an integral part of a certain perspective, stance, or order which we adopt in order to generate an adequate account of the phenomenon of human perception and action. However, by drawing one additional parallel between Merleau-Ponty and Dennett, we see that we cannot stop here. A standard criticism of Dennett's talk of stances is that it is anti-realist. Dennett himself says that such descriptions are not intrinsically right or wrong. Surely, however, Merleau-Ponty would not accept this consequence. The problem then remains, how can we be realists about bodily intentionality? Again, contemporary cognitive science can offer some clues. Author says, I do not propose to go into detail here since the debate about realism and instrumentalism with regard to intentional states is, an, is a large topic in itself. Very roughly, realism would seem to require commitment of two theses. One, that an intentional theory is needed to explain a phenomenon, for example, human perception, and two, intentional descriptions must be supervenient upon, although of course not reducible to, physiological ones. Supervenience guarantees that we cannot settle for just any interpretation which happens to work and gives an objective justification for deciding, at least in principle, between two incompatible but equally useful explanations. Merleau-Ponty clearly argues for the first. As we saw in the previous section, such arguments constitute the main support for introducing the concept of bodily intentionality. The second, while not explicitly argued for, certainly seems initially consistent with both the phenomena, both, uh, both phenomenology and the structure of behavior. Yeah, so I mean, you need to be able to explain what's going on when we deal with the world. I mean, that's basically it. But the body, you can claim understand something about how to interact with its own world it just does that's one of the things the body does is that it interacts with the world in a way that you can't really explain in terms of a rational thing like when you move your hands you're not explaining all the muscles it's not like you can do that okay the initial appearance of consistency is cast into doubt when the connection between supervenience and theories of mental representations is made explicit Again, very roughly, standard arguments for supervenience rely on the assumption that intentional semantical significance states supervene on states whose interactions can be described purely syntactically or formally. But if this is true of bodily intentionality, then A, we have lost what some have thought to be the heart of the distinction between bodily intentionality and traditional intentionality, because B, intentionality, including bodily intentionality, will be in an important sense symbolic. The sense of symbolic at issue here and the consequences of all this will be explored in the last section. Yeah, so how do you represent the body then? How does it actually do it? They're saying, well, it's some sort of symbolism. We just don't know what that is. But like your body actually, the way it interacts with the world has an abstraction to it. It's got built in abstraction and that's how you grasp things in your hand because your hand understands like some sort of abstract grasping. But that's gonna be a symbolic thing they're just saying right here. But how does that make any sense? So, is bodily intentionality symbolic? Is there like some sort of abstraction that goes along with how your hand moves? And is that like that abstraction in your hand? 
Okay, there are three related concepts here which must be distinguished before this question can be addressed. The concept of being symbolic, of having a formal syntactic structure, being a formal system, and of being digitally representable. The last, the least restrictive position of the three, the one I think which mis with, with, uh, the one the author thinks Merleau Ponty must accept, is the view that a state is intentional if and only if it is it is related to a, spe a specified way to a is related in a specified way to a symbol which represents something and which is able to function as it does because it has certain properties which are specifiable non semantically. This should not be conflated with the claim that. The symbols or mental representations have complex linguistic structure, which is built up of components combined according to a syntactically specifiable rules. Fi yeah, so that's basically saying there is some logic there, but it doesn't have to be a logic that we are building up according to syntax uh, and the rules therein. Finally, one has the thesis that the entire system is digital, which further claims which further claims that the components are discrete and rules are satisfied in an all or nothing way. And see, we wouldn't say this now, digital. You'd say either um, old style is recursive or now computable. Um, so the entire system is computable, even if we don't know what it is, but it is a, a, a computable system. Okay. A picture might be symbolic, a tran transducer such as the optic nerve or a tape recorder may instantiate a formal system and standard computers are digital. Yeah, so it's, it's you wouldn't call it digital. That has no, that's kind of meaningless here as an 80s term, but you'd say it would be computable so and standardly computable as that formal system. <coughs> it is important to distinguish these positions to avoid confusion. Thus, I will argue only that Merleau-Ponty must accept a theory on which bodily intentionality is symbolic. This does not entail that he must agree that symbols are syntactically complex or digitally specify yeah, speci specificable. Specificable? That's weird. Not specifiable. All right. That, that, however, will be enough to establish that bodily intentionality does not represent a radical break with the traditional concept. It will also force modifications to the picture of bodily intentionality as preconceptual or as not requiring representations. These modifications may elicit cries of outrage from those like Dreyfus who have cast Merleau-Ponty as a champion in the fight against cognitive science. The validity of those objections must be reevaluated in light of the dis distinctions just drawn. First, however, I must justify the claim that Merleau-Ponty's account of bodily intentionality presupposes symbolic representation. Yeah, you're going to have to argue that because I didn't, I mean, I've only heard the Dreyfus uh, account of Merleau-Ponty and he definitely would not have argued this. Um, yeah. The bottle, that bodily intentionality is symbolic follows directly from the thesis that intentional descriptions are super are supervenient on the non-intentional facts about the body as physical entity in its environment. And for anyone who doesn't know, basically that's saying whatever's happening at a larger level has some sort of uh, micro level um, correspondence. So like uh, your thoughts supervene on your brain, because if anything changes in your brain, then your thoughts, are, you know, if any thoughts change, then something has to change in your brain. Basically, it's supervenience is saying the two, like something at a higher level is definitely related to something at the lower level. Um, but we don't necessarily know how that happens. But that's basically what it says. At the high level, if there's any change there, then it has to also be reflected at the low level. Okay. Supervenience tells us that there are features of the body which can A, characterized can be a characterized formally or non-intentionally and also b serve as the medium in which intentional states are realized that is that which with that without which our intentionalist descriptions would not be descriptions of real features in the world yeah so if you have something that is uh some sort of intentional concept that means there's something in your head or in your body that is the feature in the real world of course, these features are not different power, not a different power of being from the intentional state, nor is the intentionality of anything added to the feature as a new ingredient. Thus, we have features of the body as it is situated in the world, which have formal properties and also significance. That is symbol symbols. Yeah. So basically it's saying, look, if you're assuming the world is symbolic in some way or no, that we are symbolic in some way, then that has a physical analog somehow. We don't have to explain how, but somehow this is how it is. 
right? Author says, surprisingly, Merleau-Ponty accepts a view very much like this, at least occasionally. Quote, we are saying that the body, insofar as it has behavior patterns, is that strange object which uses its own parts as a general system of symbols for the world and through which we can consequently be at home in that world and understand it and find it and find significance in it. And I'm sorry that Sinosemiotics isn't here. He'd probably uh, be jumping up and down about the sy system of symbols for the world. That's how we uh, the semiotic view there. So this is basically saying, in, if you're going to look at it semiotically, that our body has this automatic uh, symbolic relationship to the world, like the signified signifier, and that's how we'd be physically related to the world. All right, continuing. One last point about symbols and the case against bodily intention. One last point about symbols and the case against bodily intentionality is complete. Symbols represent things, but they cannot represent them simplic simplicator. Simplic yeah, they're missing an I and simplicator. Simplicator, they say here. It is difficult to be precise about this, but a first approximation is all that is necessary at this point. The fact that symbols do not merely present objects is related to the fact that the object intended is transcendent. Our perception or grasping of an object is always incomplete, always indicates the possibility of further new perceptions. The symbol which represents the object therefore cannot represent everything about the object. Another way of putting the same point is to note that symbols always involve abstraction. Certain properties of the object, certain elements of the situation are represented while others are left indeterminate. This discussion of symbols sounds dangerously cr uh, close to Husserl. And remember what I was saying. What Husserl was saying is that you get a group of uh, uh, like a bundle of uh, logic, a symbolic thing. That's what you get from the world. And so you're not like got this bodily intentionality of how the body relates, but like our perception gets a, a, like a formal structure from the world. And that's why they're saying this is getting dangerously close to Husserl. Is this the insistence that Merleau-Ponty's account of bodily intentionality must be symbolic, just a way of reintroducing the Husserlian noema and the idea that each perceived object has its proper eidos or essence which can be reevaluated, revealed through phenomenological reflection? No and yes. <laughs> this is what I was talking about. The noema is the bundle of uh, logical, structured things that you get from the world. Okay, so doesn't say so they're saying the all right so we're not just reintroducing Husserl but it can be uh, but what can be revealed through phenomenological reflection yes you can get that nothing that has been said about symbols requires that the symbol that, that the symbolic content must be universal that it must grasp the essence of the object intended or even that the object intended has an essence at all and that's kind of what the noema was getting at was that you're getting some sort of essence of the thing in the world nor must symbolic representation be explicated with reference to an ideal entity and noema. Yeah, so this is the noema is this like perfect bundle of the world thingy. In this way, talk of symbols would be as appropriate to act mapped. Yeah. In this way, talk of symbols would be as appropriate to act matter in logical investigations as it would be in noemata. In a, I don't know what this. Okay, I'm not sure because I don't remember all my lingo. I'm sorry. But in this way, talk of symbols would be as appropriate to act matter in logical investigations as it would be to noemata in ideas. Yeah, so the lots of noema, no, noemata. However, the need for symbols does not require the acceptance of certain other Husserlian elements. The object as intended, as represented by symbols, well, it will have undergone a process of abstraction and categorization. A symbol, even a pictorial symbol, preserves some facets of what it represents and, omit, and omits others. In doing so, the object is implicitly categorized. It is an object, one of the many possible objects of this type, rather than that type. So it's individual there. Thus, it becomes appropriate to say that bodily intentionality requires representation of its objects as subsumed under a concept. Yeah, so this is the abstraction here, is that the body already assumes concepts of certain sorts. I mean, does it? I don't know, but they're saying that the body already has, uh, you like your hands already have a concept of things that they can grasp, and that is a part of the abstraction of the things that, like, are hand graspable. Um, and so, like, if you're gonna go hide a Garion on me, you'd be like, well, the the hand grasp, the like the grasping grasps, 
So that would be that. But this thing, well, the body, how does that work? It's that it, the hand already has this abstraction of graspability that it, it's built into what it is to be a hand. Or at least, at least something with opposable thumbs. <laughs> Sorry, all you um, non-opposable thumb people out there. However, this conclusion cast doubt on the claim that bodily intentionality represents a radical departure from the traditional concept of intentionality. Arguments for this position proceed by portraying bodily intentionality as not requiring symbolic representation or explicit concepts or rules, while I have just argued that it must involve representations and concepts. We can still speak, as Husserl does, of a novel intentional analysis, but the analysis will be one in which traditional intentionality is seen to enclose is seen to include bodily intentionality, not one in which bodily intentionality manages the astounding feat of having significance without representations. What then of Merleau-Ponty's charge that the traditional conception of intentionality is inadequate as a framework within which to account for perception and action? I think that some valuable insights can be preserved here, even if we deny that bodily intentionality is distinct from other, more intellectual forms of intentionality. I suggested earlier that being symbolic need not involve a formal system. Thus, the symbols operative in perception need not be analyzable into distinct parts, each corresponding to a simple qual, yeah, like a qualia, I think it's a quail, a single one of the qualia is a quail. Merleau-Ponty can retain his woolly blue because they are not analyzable in this way, they need not be expressible in language. Finally, the features of the body, body upon which intentionality supervenes need not be limited to strictly internal properties of the brain. They can be facts about the way the, bo w the, facts about the, way the body as a whole, including brain states, is related to its environment. Nonetheless, bodily intentionality will involve explicit representations of some sort. Those like Dreyfus who hope to move away from that feature of intentionality as traditionally conceived will find no comfort here. Okay. So this is interesting. I haven't heard this because I, like I said, I'm not an expert in this area. The only account of um, Merleau-Ponty I've heard was that of Dreyfus, who basically says what this author says is that this is completely non-representational. But like, given this quote up here, um, it seems that uh, Merleau-Ponty says it is a system of symbols for the world. The problem this author has is what they just said right here is that you can't talk about it these are they need not be analyzable into distinct parts so that means you can't break it down there's not going to be some sort of quality that you can point to an individual piece of this they're not analyzable in this way they need not be expressible in any language so how are we talking about it right now we're talking about the whole system i guess needs to be expressible in the language but that's kind of a really hard ask because you're trying to talk about something you just said that you might not be able to talk about and so the idea that like my hand has a concept of uh grasping like the hand the, like the like the grasping hand grasps or um has a concept of abstract grasping built into my hand that what things i can pick up like i can pick up like this uh, quarter here is a u.s quarter like whatever you don't have to see that or like the pen i have here like the fact that it can do this and i don't have to think about it means that it's built into my hand in some sense and since we're on twitch it's like you play video games here you don't have to think about pressing you have to think about pressing all the buttons but your hand you don't think about how to move your hand to play the video games that are that you're watching people play on twitch it's like this just happens but the problem is they're saying you need not be able to express this abstraction in language but then what are we talking about it sounds like this whole thing has turned into some massive um idealization where you're saying well there is this formal system but we just don't know what it is and we can't know what it is so this is like super interesting stuff that you're saying like the hand the grasp the like the hand has a concept of grasping on its own but like what the hell is that yeah exactly frank big time like the author's trying to have their cake and eat it too you're trying they're trying to talk about something in language that you're saying may not be expressible in language but it seems to be a little bit self-refuting here um so maybe this is why dreyfus wanted to avoid this formal system when you say the way your hand moves, you are using a symbol I do understand. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's the thing. Um, I know you're aiming at a feeling. I might not. Like, but, like, that's the thing. Like, but <coughs> it's not, like, this is not the craziest thought, though. 
Like the thing is, it's not the craziest thought. You can't explain how your hand does all the thing it does. Like you can explain it basically, you can break it down. But if you just reach out and pick something up, you're not thinking about all the little movements you made just to reach out and pick up a pen. Like you just can't. Like there's too many things you can move your hand faster than you can think about all the little movements you have to be making to like, you know, twirl a pen around or whatever. And so it's like, then you're, the author wants to say, well, that is symbolically uh, describable in some way. It's like that, yes, but no. It's like that you can't have it both ways, claiming that like maybe Merleau-Ponty did say it is describable symbolically. Does that mean that the hand has this sort of a formal system built into it? Like, what is that formal system? Um, and how is that related to the other formal systems like logic? Um because that's what, uh, you know, that's kind of what Husserl was saying, that you're just given the logic as in a, univer a universally abstractable thing. And that would put uh, Merleau-Ponty very much towards the Husserlian side and away from the Heideggerian body side. Frank Brigtime says, The feeling set of movements may only may only have meaning in your body and only have the roughest analogs to movement that might happen in some other body. Yeah, and that's a good question. Why... Um, would there be some sort of the, the author said this they were saying this was part of their criticism of uh Husserl that these may not have any relation to any my body may the way it works may not have a any relation to how your body works and so the formal systems may be incompatible but like they're saying if they were compatible that would be some sort of universal and they were saying that was against the Husserlian um thing here um where where was that yeah, yeah. Oh, it's up here. Uh, symbols. Yeah, the content must be universal. Like, nothing that has been said about symbols required that the symbolic content must be universal. And so this is trying to avoid this uh, Husserlian idea. But, like, they're, they're also claiming it's a formal system. What the fuck is a formal system if it doesn't relate to other formal systems? These things have to at least be, if even if they don't, like, uh, agree with each other, they have to be, like, inter-understandable as formal systems. That's, like, a misunderstanding of what it is to be a formal system. Like, I can't tell you that there's a logic that I know that you can't know. Like, I can't do that. It's not a logic at that point. Now, it might be some sort of formal system. Is it? Really? Because, basically, if you can write down a logic, someone else has to be able to do it. Otherwise, it's a private language. And then you get into the, Wittgenstein, uh, the Wittgensteinian side of, uh, side of things. Uh, Frank Big Time asks, can you say it can't be related in any language that simplifies the description of reality? Yeah, but then why is it a description in language anymore? Like, you're going to have trouble. Like, you're saying, well, it's a private language. And this is what I'm just saying. You're going to run into other problems of uh, philosophy of language at this point. Because it does. is it going to be a logic? Is it going to have any logic? Because if it's going to have any logic that that language describes reality in, then that logic has to be, in some sense, describable to somebody else otherwise it's some sort of something that's completely subjective to you but then why are you calling it a language or why are you calling it a logic um what is there that is outside of um like pure description that only makes sense to you like it it doesn't like it's very hard uh you daimonia hello you're new here to find an absolute moral truth well just read your name a lot of times and you got it um, welcome in, you Daimonia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you came into a philosophy stream with the name you Daimonia. That's a uh, Aristotelian ex. The word for like what Aristotle had for excellence. Um, we're doing some phenomenology at the moment. Uh, feel free to ask whatever questions or ask about whatever else we're talking about. But the idea is like, how does this person? They they want like I was saying early. You wouldn't call it excellence. Uh, well, okay. How would you call it? I'm not an Aristotelian. Oh, the final ca the final cause of man. Okay. Like what it is to be uh, the proper human being is to have, you know, a flourishing life. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my buddy, uh, let's see, philosophy friends. If you want to talk about like ethics and stuff, you go click on my buddy and give uh, Aristotle a follow. He's the first link there. He is an expert in ancient and uh philosophy if you know who he is may have found him through uh found me through him a lot of people do but yeah but like he uh you can ask him anything and he's better at that stuff i'm doing metaphysics at the moment need me to fucking ban anyone if you want go right ahead like i don't know 
I don't, I don't, I haven't had any problems, but welcome in Vipers. How you been? Um, yeah, <laughs> we were just reading this thing about, uh, the proper relationship of like the you. world. Hey, thanks for the follow you diamond. Yeah. Appreciate the follow. Um, yeah. It, like, it, can you argue that like the, the, the hand sort of like the grasping hand grasps, that's like what it does. And does your hand actually have a con like, is the concept of grasping just in the structure of your hand? Now, if it is in the structure of your hand, does that constitute a formal system? I'm arguing no. I don't think that does. The author here kind of thinks it does, but they say, well, you can't describe it in language. It's like, well, if it need not be expressible in language, how is it a formal system then? Like, I just don't like that. That's a disconnect here. And so they think that they can have formal systems without a linguistic basic or a, a way to even dis express it. And so it seems a little contradictory, uh, which is not good for uh, this author, or at least not for Milo Ponty as they're describing him. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Let's see, is there anything else to talk about here? You literally just woke up? Well, I hope you had a good sleep. Yeah, I mean, I'm like three hours in. I'm basically done for the night. Uh, we read a paper before this. What was that? I'm already losing my mind. Um, shit. Oh. We read a paper called Experimental Philosophy Within Its Proper Bounds, and so we were talking about, um, exp like, science and this stuff. You woke up to this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Thank you for having me on while you sleep. I guess I, maybe I knocked you out, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but, like, this is the whole thing. You have a Husserlian view of the world. What do you get in your experience? You get a like a perfectly you get like a pack a packet of logic that sort of like is an abstraction of the world, and that's how you understand what's out there. You're getting like this sort of abstracted logical packet. Then uh, Heidegger comes along and says, "No, no, 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 no. You're not getting the logical packet of anything. You are experiencing the world as it uh, is representing itself. So you're not getting like some logic of the tree. You're experiencing the tree as a tree, and that's what's going on. And then we're low." Ponty comes along and says, no, 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 no. You interact with the tree. You're not getting some logical packet, and it's not just you're experiencing the being of the tree. You're interacting it with the tree with, like, parts of your body, and the parts of your body are giving you the logic. And that's the argument here. How do you actually interact with the world? Your body is giving you symbolic information. And so it's not like you're getting something automatically from the world uh, in Husserl. It's not like you're getting some sort of giant, like, uh, opaque being from Heidegger, but that your body is giving you parts of the story in symbolic form here. And this is a 20th century uh, phenomenology for you. <coughs> yeah. So... Now, again, the author is claiming here this sort of thing. You met a streamer that doesn't identify as a philosophy streamer, the poetry reader. That's cool. Is the port are they any good at it? Um, I mean, I identify as a philosophy streamer. Like, literally the people in the uh, links are the only ones I know who identify as philosophy streamers. I don't know of anyone else that does. Let me know. He's good at it, but he's super religious. Okay, that's cool. Should like give him a drop him a follow or something. Let's go write down the name at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, see that's cool. Um, like a poetry stuff thing. Yeah, uh, I bet there's some like religion people out there too. I don't know them. I know a bunch of uh like science streamers and stuff, and uh, our good funny sh uh, friend Shane McGinnis. Uh, I should. Uh, a peaceful town where nothing ever happens. So yeah, that's our buddy Shane McGinnis. He's a, a sociologist, and uh, he's not a philosopher, but he's a real smart dude. So like, I these are the people like um, sort of in this our little circle here. Uh, I want to check out the uh, poetry reader. Um, but yeah, you asked him yesterday: Is it moral to oppose your will upon another? And what did? the poetry reader say i mean if you are going to be on twitch and you're call and you're reading poetry you are definitely imposing something on the world 
Like anyone who's streaming is imposing something on the world. It's just how it is. And uh, of course, we also have. I should make a because uh, uh, an infernal also. I don't think I can do uh, two shout outs immediately, but uh, she is also an academic or ex academic here. So that's Anne. You can click on the link. And so, like, she's also a sociologist. She knows a massive amount of stuff. And so you can always ask her interesting questions, too. And you wanted to lead into good, uh, lead into God, imposed his will upon Jesus, and so Jesus had no free will at all. And on this religious streamer with a strong moral ethical background. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're asking sort of the theological question. Is it, um, what's the, like, theological background of, like, God imposing their will on their son? Jesus and uh, as such okay yeah see I'm not like I don't know enough theology to be talking about that um, to, no to be giving a sensical answer about like what actually the folks uh, who know this stuff would say but that's interesting yeah Viper says I used to watch Christian streamer because she was very attractive with less than angelic history and I was just fascinated by the car the car wreck yeah that's also fun it's like you see these people um oh she was a fraud shocking but yeah um yeah train wrecks are kind of interesting um I tend to watch them very sh for a short amount of time and I just start shaking my head and don't come back but yeah a lot of that stuff is uh it has its, like, sort of charms to it. Like, it's like, wow, why are they doing this? And then you find out, yeah, they're a fraud in the end, or, like, they had something else going on. Frank, big time, asks, Can God make a Jesus so aligned with his will that it doesn't count as an imposition of his will? Yeah. Again, this is one of these uh, theological questions, like, what it is to, is it really any different from God if they create part of themselves that is just themselves, or basically exactly the same? I don't even know. Like, I don't even know. I, I can't, like, to Viper's point, I've definitely watched people just because I found them gorgeous. And uh, their content was, you know, less than stellar. Um, but, like, whatever. I wasn't doing anything inappropriate. I didn't say anything bad. It's like, whatever. I'm sure they appreciated the lurk. You can't even align with your own will? <laughs> Well, ask Will what he wants, and maybe then you can go align with him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, again. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, if you The question is, like, Will, and, like, what is that? I don't even know. You're afraid Will will slap me? Oh, Will should not be that violent, then. That's not good. Um, yeah. Yeah, go ban Will, Vipers. I don't want violent people like that in my chat. And then we free the Will. Free the Will. Yeah, so this is a question. The author was arguing that Merleau-Ponty right here is saying that the body is that strange object which which uses its own parts as a general system of symbols for the world. So that means... The hand itself is a system of symbols for the world and through which we can cons consequently be at home in the world and understand it and find significance in it. You were just arguing, you Daimonia, that you wanted to see identify that a God choosing morals is arbitrary. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the, a religious streamer would not accept that conclusion. Um, they would say the morals that they chose were, you know, necessary. Um... But yeah, they'd say, well, those were the only things Jesus could do because they were the necessary ones. So maybe God didn't have to impose it because Jesus would just naturally go that way. Um, I don't know. Like, again, not my area of the world or my area of uh, reasoning. But yeah. So you were removing Jesus' will from the equation or attempting to? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, again, I, I just don't know what the theology is there in that system. Like, in that formal system, in some sense, where you have free will, where God has given everyone free will and then restricts people to doing the thing. Is there free will? What is the freedom left? 
it's like, well, does Jesus always, this is like a, in philosophy, in ethics, we have something called compatibilism, where basically you don't have free will, but you only are doing what you would do if you, as if you did have free will. So it's like, well, you don't have any option to do otherwise, but you are doing what you would be doing otherwise if it were free anyway. So it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I hate compatibilism. I think it's nonsense. But like, this is what people, this is people trying to, you know, like slice, you know, square the circle as it were. They're trying to get something that like basically it makes very little sense, but might not be contradictory. Like, so it's nonsense, but like uh, you can, once you accept that one sort of weird state of the world, which a lot of people hold that this is what uh, Christianity uh, Christianity is, is that once you understand like the Trinity is three things and one thing, once you understand this sort of strange uh, theology, then you can sort of make sense of everything else once you bite that bullet. But like the problem is once you bite that bullet, you already, then you, you're already in that camp. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else says at that point. So that's the thing. If you want to remove Jesus's will from the equation, it doesn't matter because there's like the Trinity and then like it's all built into that. Again, I, I can't speak authoritatively on that. So I feel I apologize to anyone. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to... Well, I don't argue with them. I just don't even try. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, getting into arguments like that because I don't know enough to, uh, you know... Like, I don't think I can get anywhere, frankly. I am not. I have nothing to say, first of all. I have, like, no goal in arguing with them. Like, I'm not trying to get to some... Um, you know, I have no conclusion I'd be trying to get to. So it's like, I don't argue with them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but, like, again, I'll argue the points. But, like, I can argue the logic of it, but I just, like, I have no goal in this. Viper says, is there anything out there on how much exploring philosophical ideas can be confused with exploring the logic of language? Yes. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in the Wittgensteinian tradition that basically says a lot of philosophy is just language confusions. And so people have gone into in doing that. That's one of uh, Wittgenstein's big claims, Vipers, is that basically a lot of our stuff is just like log. A lot of our problems are just like logical confusions. I can tell you basically that there's no good answer there, though. You're not going to find out because any problems that people have are going to be like in that area, in that semantics. Then they're going to say, OK, well, you shouldn't have been arguing this. One of his metaphors was that uh, lead the fly out of the fly bottle. Now, if you've seen a fly bottle, I don't know if you have. They're not common anymore. But basically, it's a fly, lead the fly out of the fly trap. And what a fly trap is is like basically a one-way box. But usually, you can get a fly out of a fly, uh, fly trap if they do some very impressive flying. And a fly bottle has a hole in the bottle. Flies never fly straight down. And so a fly bottle is a fly trap that basically forces the fly to fly straight up. So it will never fly straight down. And so basically saying you have to lead people the way back out of the stupid things that they've got them, uh, like the stupid patterns, like the, that they've got themselves into. So it's true. You diamond Nina says, if I can invalidate their identity along with the way, maybe that's worthwhile. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like some tough love there. And they might like grow up a little bit, but I, I mean, I'm going to be on the Viper's gratitude side here. I don't think they care. I think they're doing it for other reasons, like either they're fraud or they're just like completely off the deep end. A lot of these people. And so it's like, I don't know if you can actually invalidate their, uh, identity. Um, because that just is going to piss them off and people are going to double down at that point. But if it works, it works. Hey, like if they're being like silly and you can like help them out to see that it's good. Um, but like this is just sociological, um, what I'm saying, you know, Vipers agrees. People are not going to change, um, when they feel attacked, usually. It's just not how people are, uh, in terms of history. Yeah. Not, uh, Viper says, it's about identity. This is who they feel they are, and so you can't try to tell them this is not who you should be, because they just, people just don't like that. They just don't like it. And so... I mean, what's your goal, Eudaimonia? Like, if you are you trying to, like, help them out of some bad ideas, you know, you can do that, sure. But, like, um, if you're going to uh, ask them about, like, their identity and, like, what, what they feel, they're going to get, like, uh, they're going to feel attacked. And it's just going to be hard. 
<sighs> Okie dokes. So. Yeah, I don't know if I have a whole lot more to say about this. I just find this very interesting. I didn't under... I've never heard this uh, claim that the body itself um, has the symbolic abstractions in it. I don't understand how it can have it because they're saying it's non-linguistic. And so I don't know what a symbol is that's non-linguistic or can't be described in language. Not that, of course, symbols can be like some sort of abstraction and not in a language. But the idea that it can't be described in language is very hard. Oh, your goal is to spread knowledge? Then more power to you, you diamond you. Yeah, it's like method of getting things across. I mean, you're talking about rhetoric at that point. How are you getting your point across? And if it works for you, that's great. Um, yeah, basically. It's like, I, like I said, I don't attempt to, uh, yeah, I, well, I just don't argue with people mostly at this point. Uh, like someone comes into chat, they ask me a question. We have a discussion. That's cool. But, um, I don't go out looking for arguments. I don't need to do that. Um. I, can, I have enough argue, I have enough problems on my own. Motivation can be a strong moral ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so if you're trying to talk people into a... You know, you can go ask people and you can sort of like tease out their ideas. That's cool. Like, that's good times. Um, yeah. Viper says, I'm still confused as to the topic of this paper. Is he saying that we're like octopi or limbs have brains? Yes, um, but like this is phenomenology. It's so it's saying how what is the proper way to understand intentionality? How do we interact with the world? What is it to do that? And they're saying the way you actually understand the world is not through like an abstraction or a representation. This was at the beginning of the paper that you weren't here for. But if you want to talk about like how you understand the world, you understand the world by interacting with it with your body and your hand can interact with like, say, a pen or something without actually you don't have to have like a representation of um how your hand is working to manipulate the pen you just manipulate the pen and so they're saying not only do we not have to think about how to manipulate the pen that actually is kind of an abstraction that the hand itself does it's not that it, the brain like there's a brain in like a like the limb of the octopus it's that the hand itself is a symbolically organ uh, symbolically uh, manipulative thing and that's what it is to be able to manipulate a pen is to have a formal system of uh, a formally structurable system uh, in your hand that this is a symbolic representation in some weird abstract way that's what they're saying schema that's fine yeah that's a good word word for it so like there's some sort of like uh, abstract schema that your hand has in itself that allows it to do things and so this is a metaphysics of how you uh, interact with the world and then that's how you build up what um, your, are your interactions with the world is from like your hand like your other senses your sight that's how you're interacting with the world is a, like this sort of physical interaction um, gives you some sort of um, symbolic systems that then larger that can then interact and then that's what our mind interacts with is this like the symbolic stuff in your world ax exploring the nature of system one thinking yeah i think that's right um so it's a bit more complicated than that when you try to get into the exact details of how we interact with the world um it's not a bad paper this is from 1988 though it is dated so like they were talking about things that we call computable as they called it digital in this paper which is not uh, like just the wrong term um they were calling it a digital thing which makes no sense but what they meant in the old terms was a uh, recursive and nowadays we call computability um so like the, they were saying like the symbols in your hand are digital, which is wrong. But they were saying it's basically a, a computation that your hand makes in itself um, about how to interact with the world. <sighs> but there is no representation there. It's just some sort of like embedded symbol. Um, are you sure it wasn't a pun? No, there's no puns. This was not a pun. Uh, if I missed a joke, perhaps, or Lin, like, this is not a joke. Like, I don't think I said anything that was even remotely punny or, um, 
in the least. <laughs> the hand being... Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. Um, no, because where, where was digital? Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Nope, wrong thingy. Yeah, so the concept of being symbolic, of having a formal syntactic structure, being a formal system, and of being digitally representable. Yeah, so it, this is... um. I've been talking about hands. They weren't talking about hands in this part. The least restricted position of the three, the one who was the little ponty. See, and like, yeah. And, and down here, standard computers are digital. Like, they're literally talking about this. So, um... Like, I, they weren't talking about hands at this point. So, like, it, it, like it, I just I only brought it up because showing the uh, age of the paper um, when they're saying about standard computers are, like, it's talking about computability when they're saying they've got the wrong word, basically. Um, that's all. <coughs> so, yeah. Yeah, see, so a picture might be symbolic. A transducer, such as the optic nerve or a tape recorder, may instantiate a formal system, and and standard computers are digital. It's like, no. It means you're instantiating a recursive system that is computable. So. Like Turing Complete or something. Like, they mean something along Turing Complete lines. I don't know. Instantiate, great word? Yeah. Um, gets used a lot in logic. So, uh, let's see. 